Jesus teachings are filled with contradictions but they all were used to guide individuals towards that center that was his core approach he did not have a core philosophy or core teachings but he had a core purpose although when you ask him what is the purpose of life he says there is no purpose but one look at his life you can tell it was a life of enormous purpose it was so purposeful that when he decided to become a teacher that is the only thing he did everything else revolve around that role that he had assigned himself now if there was no purpose to his life if there is no purpose at all to life how can you find such consistency he was a teacher for decades he did not stop in the middle and become something else even without putting any effort he was consistent because it was not him his mind or his body that was trying to be consistent like the way it is for most people they have to put an effort to hold on to something because he had become the truth he had gone deep into his being he had realized the ultimate truth there was no effort required it was natural for him to be very close to that center and sharing was what his center enjoyed the most that can be different with different enlightened beings some individuals might decide to stay quiet some individuals might choose to speak only about realization they don't want to talk philosophy they don't want to talk society there are all kinds of enlightened teachers osho spoke about everything but he was operating from that center there is no need to find a consistent message in his teachings because there isn't any that is why the only way to understand him and his teachings is to approach it as a student as a seeker not as someone who's trying to understand his life you cannot understand his life that is the mistake people have made and they are continuing to make and it is the same mistake people have made around every awakened individual they try to understand their lives based on their actions when in fact the true essence of who they are comes from the space they occupy not from what they do and what they say for christians crucifixion of jesus is the authentic proof of his divinity he chose to sacrifice himself so for them his action his choices they are more important than even his message the whole worship tradition of jesus revolves around crucifixion it is the cross that is being worshiped not jesus's book it is a man hanging on the cross who is being worshiped not the one who is sitting in meditation that is how these people have been misunderstood there's so much emphasis on action around osho people are more hung up on the naked people in his ashram all the crazy meditations 
the Rolls Royce he was driving, the diamond wristwatch he wore, the way in which he openly flaunted his wealth. This is what people are hung up on. But in reality, he has nothing to do with any of this. In fact, he comes into these things only when it is necessary, when he is teaching. When he steps away from the teacher role that he takes upon himself for a few hours every day, he is an absolute nobody. He does not care about his Rolls Royces. He does not care about all the wealth. Osho didn't care about money at all. He didn't know anything about the finances of the ashram. The entire thing was managed by someone else. He neither gave instructions nor managed the ashram. He spent most of his time in silence. There was a period of time for three years he did not speak and he did not interact with any other member of the ashram except for Sheila. And Sheila was controlling everything. She was talking to the disciples. She was giving orders. She was managing the finances. The property was in her name. It was she and her husband who were managing the center. Osho had nothing to do with any of this. Well, he did not even have a legal status to own anything in America. He came on a visitor visa and he stayed back. He did not have the green card. Well, that's another story as to why he did not get the green card. When he was supposed to attend the green card interview, he was in silence. Now, you can try and get a sense of the type of individual you are dealing with here. An individual who does not attend his visa interview and he knows that this is the country he's going to be living in. This is where his center is being developed. It makes perfect sense to get his visa to legally stay here. But because during that period he was in silence, the authorities were told that he cannot talk. What is the point of taking an interview? He's in silence and they denied him the visa. How can we give a visa to someone who's sitting in silence? We have to interview him. That is the space he was in. The problem is when he was in that space, he was alone. His silence was his own. Whatever people could see and understand was his noise, was his action. And that too for a few hours every day. It's amazing that people don't think anything beyond what they are seeing and hearing. They don't do their own investigation. They don't try to understand an individual. It comes naturally to us to blame someone. It comes naturally to us to dislike someone, especially when we are being told by someone else to like or dislike someone else. We love being told what to do because the media was creating a negative image around him. All that was happening in the ashram was being interpreted negatively People simply heard these and started drawing their own conclusions. When in fact, he was totally detached from everything that was happening in the ashram. In fact, when the interviewer asks him after 
all the commotion and the police investigation had already begun and they had thrown out Sheila. And when Osho was asked, didn't you know what was happening? Osho says, no, I don't know. And the interviewer says, you will have a hard time convincing the authorities that you didn't know what was happening. And he says, I know. They won't understand. There is no way to understand because such men don't come often. What happened there in that ashram doesn't happen often. When there is no way to understand the space an individual is occupying, which pretty much determines everything he is and everything he does, how can you expect to understand his actions? That is why he had no other option but to simply go back. Otherwise, they would have thrown him in prison under some charges. And he would not have survived the prison. He knows that. His body is just a shell for him. He's using it for teaching. That's about it. He did not exercise his body. There was no need to unnecessarily take care of it. His body was in a very delicate condition. So delicate that he could only sit on a certain kind of chair, certain kind of cushion. What will he do in prison? He would not have survived just being there. Forget about eating that food and living amongst those people. And that is when, in my opinion, he made one of the wisest of choices. Instead of trying to prove to the world that he is willing to fight for his right to stay here, he simply said, well, wherever I am is where I want to be. I'll go back. He simply went back to India and he lived there for another five or six years before his death. The Osho that you know about on the outside is hardly of any significance. That Osho is useful for the media for their ratings. That Osho is useful for Sheila to run her business. But as a seeker, as someone who's trying to understand Osho, the teacher, Osho, the enlightened man, you have to start from the inside. You have to forget all about his outside. They are meaningless. His Rolls Royce, his diamond watches, his jet plane, all that activity that was going on around him, the whole city they built, thousands of acres of land, millions of dollars pouring in. None of that mean anything. Those are all dead things that died with him. But the Osho that you should be interested in is the one who will continue to be alive, just like the way Buddha was. The one who lives in his words, the one who has poured his being in his teachings. Mm -hmm.